Welcome to your AP Statistics Chapter 15 video on probability. Now we've started our discussion of probability last chapter and we will continue with um, more situations in this chapter. Now last time we talked about the prob the addition rule for disjoint events. Okay, so with disjoint events, the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. So what happens if the events aren't disjoint? Well, let's look and see. If we add the probability of A plus the probability of B, we've double added the A and B portion. So what we have to do is we have to correct our formula by subtracting off the probability of A and B. So we do the probability of A plus the probability of B. Oops, we've added this part twice, so we subtract it off. To be honest, we could use this formula for um, the disjoint events because the probability of A and B is zero, so you would just end up with the correct probability of A plus probability of B. So if you want to memorize just one formula, the general rule is the way to go. We need to talk about conditional probability. If we, you remember back to chapter three, we looked at two-way tables or contingency tables, and we talked about conditional distributions. Well, related to that, um, we can talk about conditional probabilities. And a conditional probability is an event from a conditional distribution, and we write it as probability of B given A. So this little line right here, like half of an absolute value bar, that is read given. So probability of B given A. And what that means is if we know that A occurs under that condition, what's the probability that B occurs? And um, the way that we find that probability is we do the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. The probability of A cannot equal zero since we know that A has occurred because it's given that it occurred. So we don't have to worry about dividing by zero. Okay, since we've talked about conditional probability, we can now talk about the general multiplication rule. It's great when uh, two events A and B are independent, such as um, rolling a die and drawing one card out of a deck of cards. The probability of A and B would just be the probability of A times the probability of B. But what if the two events aren't independent? What if I want to draw two cards out of a standard deck of cards without replacement? Like It's just like a little hand you know, of, of two cards. How would I figure out the probability of, say, getting the Queen of Hearts and the Ace of Diamonds? Well, the way you do that is by using the general multiplication rule, which would be the probability of A times the probability of B given A. And we can reverse the condition and, and do the probability of B times the probability of A given B. Independence of two events means that the outcome of one event does not influence the probability of the other. So drawing two cards from a deck of cards does um, is an event that's not independent because the probability of drawing the Queen of Hearts is 1 out of 52. And once I have that, the probability of... Um, getting the ace of spades has now gone to one out of 51 because there's only 51 cards left in the deck. Um, one way that we can tell that two events are independent is if the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. That means that whatever you get, whatever outcome you get um, for A, that's not going to change your probability of B. The, the probability of you know, um, rolling a one with a fair die and, and drawing the queen of hearts, that's going to be um, your probability of getting queen of hearts is one out of 52, whether or not you've successfully rolled a one. With two-way tables, never assume two variables are independent. It's tempting, but not valid. So you don't want to use... Um, 
this formula when you're doing using a two-way table what you're going to do is is work with that conditional um distribution people get independent and disjoint confused all the time disjoint events cannot be independent well why not well if i know event a occurs the probability that uh, event b occurs goes all the way down to zero so Independent events cannot be disjoint. A common error is to treat disjoint events as though they were independent and apply the multiplication rule for independent events. Don't make that mistake. All right, depending on independence, it's much easier to think about independent events than to deal with conditional probabilities. It seems that most people's natural intuition for probabilities breaks down when it comes to conditional probabilities. So we really have to work on um, developing um, concepts that uh, may be contrary to just what your natural tendency to believe is. So don't fall into that trap. Whenever you see probabilities multiplied together, stop and ask whether you think they are really independent. And remember, never assume the variables in a two-way table are independent. Drawing with replacement. Um, or uh, without replacement, which is like the two cards that I talked about. Sampling without replacement means that once one individual is drawn, it doesn't go back into the pool. We often sample without replacement, which doesn't matter too much when we are dealing with a large population. So if you have a thousand uh, cards, drawing the first card and the probability of that being a specific card is one out of a thousand, and then the next one would be one out of 999. For all practical purposes, that would be the same. However, when drawing from a small population like the litter of puppies, we need to take note and adjust the probabilities accordingly. So the probability of, of drawing, if you look right here, we've got one, two, three, four golden puppies out of a total of seven puppies aren't they cute the probability of drawing one golden puppy and saying okay this one's mine that's four sevenths now if you decide to get a buddy for that one and you you reach in and you grab another one and it's golden given that the first one was golden the probability of grabbing that second golden um puppy is three out of six okay because there's only six puppies left and there's only three of the goldens left Drawing without replacement is just another way, and another instance of working with conditional probabilities. Tree diagrams are really helpful when we have conditional probabilities um, under the situation where you have a sequence of events. Uh, making a tree diagram for situations with conditional probabilities is consistent with our make a picture mantra. So this figure is a nice example of a tree diagram and shows how the probabilities of the branches work together. Um, when you get out here to the final probabilities, every it should add up to one because every possible outcome should be represented. So what we have here is um, the probability that a randomly selected, I believe college student binge drinks is 0.44. And the probability that a randomly selected college student drinks moderately is 0.37. And then the probability that a randomly um, selected college student does not drink at all is 0.19. Now, we're looking at whether or not they have a car accident. So if you look right here, the probability on this little, the little branch of having an accident, not having an accident, those are conditional probabilities. So this 0.17 is the probability of having an accident given the student is a binge drinker. And the probability of not having an accident given that a student is a binge drinker is 0.83. So the conditional probabilities are here along the second branch. Now, when we get to the, the last um if combination of events here, we are going to figure the probability of 
a randomly selected student, okay, so now we've got all the students, being a binge drinker and having an accident. And the way we calculate that is probability of being a binge, binge drinker times the probability of having an accident given being a binge, binge drinker, and that comes out to be 0 0.075, okay? The probability that a randomly selected college student from the whole uh, group of college students being a binge drinker and not having an accident, that's going to be the 0.44 times 0.83, and we get 0 0.365. And you can see we have all of our different uh, probabilities of the two events on that particular branch happening and they add up to be one. Now sometimes we want to reverse the condition. We want to know given that an accident occurs what's the probability that a a student is a binge drinker. So what's the probability of binge drinking given that an accident occurs? So in this case we're going to have to consider all the different ways an accident could occur, and then from that figure out what's the probability that the person was a binge drinker versus moderate versus an, an abstainer from alcohol. All right, so the formula for this is kind of tricky. Um, it's going to be the probability of a given B times the probability of B plus the probability of A given not B times the probability of not B. And that's going to be our denominator. And then, so that's going to be all the ways to get to um, the event that, that we are um, saying is um, given. Okay. And then on top, you are going to do the probability of both A and B occurring. So that's going to be the probability of A given B times the probability of B. All right, and, and we're going to see an example of that in practice. And it to me, it's easier to look at a tree diagram and go through the logic than trying to memorize Bayes' rule. All right, let's look at an example. Um, let's say you want to find a date who is funny or good looking. Among the sample space of those who are of the appropriate age and gen gender for you to date, you would um, find 30% to be funny and 40% to be good looking. A very lucky 10% would be considered to be funny and good looking by you. So let's make a Venn diagram. You always um, start with the middle probability, the probability that both things happen. There is that little bit of overlap, those ten, the 10% of the very lucky people who you consider to be funny and good looking. They go here where you can visually see the overlap. And then you figure out the probabilities of good looking only and funny only. The whole circle for good looking has to add up to 40%. So, or 0 0.40. And so we subtract off the 0 0.10 and get that the people who are good looking but not sunny are, uh, there's a 0 0.30 probability of that being the case. And then from the 30% that we find hilarious, uh, we take off the 10% that are also good looking and we're left with 20% or 0.20. Um, neither good looking nor funny. What you do is you can add up these three probabilities, 0 0.30 plus 0 0.10 plus 0 0.20 and get um, 0 0.60 and you subtract that from one and you get 0 0.40 or you can um, we can um, also go ahead and do use the formula. Okay, so probability of good looking or funny is going to be the total probability of good looking, so 0 0.40, okay, everything, plus the probability of being funny, so 0 0.30, minus the probability, probability of good looking and funny. So since we've added this 0 0.10 twice, we would subtract it off, and so we would get 0 0.60, which agrees with the diagram. Honestly, with a Venn diagram, instead of going through the whole formula, what I tend to do if I want to know the probability of good looking or funny is I would add all the, the disjoint events here or all the, all the 
unique events that satisfy the condition. So good looking or funny means good looking only, both good looking and funny and funny only. So I tend to just do the 0.30 plus 0 0.10 plus 0 0.20 is 0 0.60. But if you want to use a formula, that is perfectly fine. All right, so let's look at um, the problem on pages 347 to 348. I can wait a minute while you um, go look that up. Okay, so we've got um, gender and goals, and so um, we've got a contingency table here. And so we want to know what's the probability that a randomly selected student is a girl. All right, well, you just do the 251 divided by 478, and that is going to be 0 0.525. Now, I will say um, to get full credit for these, you need to show what you divided. Okay, you need to show the 251 divided by 478 um, anytime you're working with probability in a two-way table. Now, in my mind, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, what means a whole lot is dividing that out and getting that it is equal to 0 0.525. So I would go ahead and divide it out and show both the original fraction and the decimal equivalent. So what is the probability that the primary goal for a student is popular, being popular? So you would take the total who want to be popular and you would divide that by 478. And that gives you 0 0.295. So what's the probability of a randomly selected student being a girl and having popularity as her main goal? Well, to your new your denominator is still going to be 478 because we're we haven't restricted this. We don't have a condition that limits who we're looking at. We're still looking at all 478 students. For our numerator, we are going to use the total. Um, total number of students who are girls and who have selected popularity as their goal. So it's going to be 91 out of 478. And so we get 0 0.190. Okay. What is the probability that a girl wants to be popular above all else? In other words, what is the probability that a student wants to be popular above all else given that this student is a girl? Okay, so we want a conditional probability. Instead of looking at all 478 students, we're just going to look at the 251 girls. So our denominator is going to be different because we are restricting our um, group to just the girls. So it, it, our numerator is going to be the same as it was when we found probability of girl and popular. And so we're still talking about the same 91 girls whose main goal is to be popular, but we're looking at, we're considering, well, what's the probability of that happening given that we know we have a girl? We've restricted ourselves to the 251 girls, 91 of them still have popularity as their main goal, and so 91 divided by 251 is 0 0.63. This is a conditional probability. You are finding a probability not for the whole sample space, but only for members who meet the condition, in this case being a girl. So the probability of choosing popular as your main goal being a girl, uh, given that, it's a gr that you have a girl, is 0 0.63. But what about the formula for conditional probability? It works. So if we do, if we find probabilities first, and then um, simplify that, we're going to get the same thing. So if we decide to do, okay, we're going to do the probability of a random student being a, a girl and choosing popular, and we're going to divide that by the probability of whatever was given, so the probability of a student being a girl, we're going to have 91 out of 478 for our numerator, and 251 divided by 478 for our denominator. And then when we convert that from dividing by a fraction to multiplying by a reciprocal, the 478s cancel, and we're back to the 91 out of 251, which divides out to be 0 0.363. All right, back to binge drinking and accidents. All right, the probability 
that a student, just to recap, the probability that a student binges is 0.44. The probability that this student has an accident, given that they binge, is 0.17. And so to get the probability that both occur, that, the, that a random student out of all the students it binges and has an accident, is 0 0.0705. And the same goes all the way down our tree diagram. Okay, so let's reverse the condition. If we know a student has had an alcohol-related accident, what's the probability that this student is a binge drinker? So we want to have it given that an accident occurs, and then we want to know, well, what's the probability that they're a binge drinker? Okay, so what we're going to do is the probability of being a binge drinker and having an accident, so that's our 0 0.075 divided by the probability of having an accident. So what you're going to do is you're going to add all the probabilities that end in an accident here. So we are going to add 0.075 to 0 0.033 to, and then we're going to add zero. That's going to give us the total probability that a student's going to have an accident, which is um, equal to 0 0.108. Um, 0 0.05 is our probability that both occur, and then when we divide by the point, uh, the 0 0.108, we get 0 0.694. So there's uh, around a 69% chance, if there's been an accident, that the student involved is um, a binge drinker. All right, guys, that's it. Go ahead and try the problems to try on your own. We will go over those in class, but if you need me, as always, I am never more than an email away, or if you want to drop by my classroom, you are always welcome to do so.